for this. So you have a lab report. The lab report's gonna be worth a great deal, approximately a thousand points. And they're in the project section. So it's a, it's a big deal. So we should talk. I felt that we should, that's why I sent you a message this weekend, not to do anything with it, because I think we need to go over it, make sure we understand. I made a number of mistakes in trying to set it up. And unfortunately, a couple of you uh, have alternative assignments. Uh, if they didn't get turned in, then uh, we'll just move on. We'll, get, we'll be able to, uh, hopefully your grade will recover. Your lab report uh, will be due next Monday, the one week from today. So it's important that we, that we review it. Your syllabus is already posted on Schoology, and I'll print it. Uh, I'll have copies here for you uh, after, uh, after this period. So, but just to outline what's going on this week, uh, we're finishing this today. We're going to do some practice problems tomorrow. You have a quiz on osmosis uh, problems, uh, diffusion osmosis problems on, on Wednesday. And then uh, you have case studies on on Thursday. On Thursday, on uh, Wednesday thir and Thursday, excuse me. Wednesday and Thursday. You have case studies to complete. Uh, the case studies are going to have to do with uh, cell transport and signaling. Specifically, we're going to be looking at diabetes and uh, insulin. All right, so that's kind of what's going on this week. Uh, I, what are some of the highlights? Uh, uh, of course, you should know, and I'm only going over this because I know some of you don't read the syllabus and then complain that you don't know what's going on, but uh, chapter eight, you should have already started reading it last week. The notes on chapter eight will be due Monday as well. All right. If you messed up and you didn't turn in your uh, any of these assignments, that's fine. It's the beginning of the quarter. Um, you need to turn in these assignments on time. Move forward, move on. Any specific personal issues, please see me uh, on Thursday after school or Thursday morning, Friday morning. On occasion, you can take a, a, a lunch pass and come and see me during lunch, but rarely is that going to be the case. All right, so let's move on. Uh, lab report, mistakes I made. Uh, I made a number of them. Uh, there was an issue with... I was confused. I think it was, where are, the, are both the, are the twins missing today? They're sick? Or are they coming? They're not coming? Okay. Halloween. Jason Myers got them. All right. Is that, that Jason Myers? Or is it some, Michael, Ma Myers. Michael Myers and Jason. What was the other? I always do that. I always, I always combine Jason, Jason and Michael Myers. Uh, let's see. That's pretend. I don't like scary movies, and they're, and that's pretend nonsense. This is real life. Could save a f human being and could help you develop a future. Which is which is? He asked a question. I'm I'm answering. All right. So moving on. Uh, we drew. We had a petri dish. And the Petri dish, we were getting some weird results. And honestly, I don't know what was wrong with me, uh, except to say that
No, I'm just waiting. I just cut a little piece of that video out and sent it to your mom. Uh, is that okay? No. Okay. All right, so when we have, when we uh, started to cut these out, we had these little squares, and I, used, and I started to use the word cube. That was the beginning of my mistake, because initially, in the, in the initial, uh, last year when I did it, and in the initial protocol, it called for a specific depth, and then you would cut out a cube, it would all that uh, out of that depth, right? That was my thought. That was my thinking. So if this was uh, three, then this was three, then the, then that was three, you know, etc. So when my thinking was when I when I spoke on it and when I started writing it up, I was thinking of a, this word cube. That was dangerous. That was wrong. Uh, it ended up messing up the entire discussion from then on. That was the that was the the basis of the mistake that led us being confused for most of the rest of the lab, as far as the how the numbers were working out. I think the lab worked out. The lab worked. It just these were not cubes. These were not cubes by definition. They were not cubes, so the, the surface area was not working out. Just didn't think of it. Sad, really. So this was one inch, and then uh, this was the only one that could have been a cube, maybe, if the depth was an inch, right? And then there was another one that was... Uh, two inch and then some uh, some people did three inch and even though the the zigzag line is true the zigzag line would have increased the surface area we didn't need to do that and I'm going to show you I hope now why so we cut the, these cubes out and they were two by two three by three one by one so we know that at least two sides at least we had a square, those people that did three by three. And then if the depth were one, one inch, then you had this thing called a prism, right? And a prism is the three that it's a three dimensional block, but it's not a cube. By definition, a cube is the same on all sides. So then, we had another another square uh, another square. Again, with the one inch being consistent, some people had point five inches. Some people had other results. Whatever. Whatever it is, there's another cube that's two inches by two inches, right? And is everybody okay with this? Because you're going to have to write it up. So you, do, uh, do you understand what I'm saying? Is there any questions so far? So this depth was one inch in this example. You may have had a different depth. It depends on what you had in your results. And then finally, there was one true cube for some people. There was one inch by one inch by one inch. So this was a true cube, all of them in centimeters. Are we all good with that so far? So really, that was, uh, that was the essence of the mistake because when you... You cannot take three, you know, when, I, when, we, when we decided to take the surface area three times three, nine, and multiply it by six, that did not work. That could not work. Because this, this is not three. The, the, air, the surface area here, I want to emphasize this, this, this depth, this depth was not, a three by three area. Does that make sense? 
This was not a three, uh, three by uh, two by two area. This though was a one by one, wasn't it? So that was one by one. So this air, these areas highlighted in green here. This area here was a three by one. And this area here was a two by one. Does that make sense? So now when you have one, two, three, four, now you have four of this area and you have two of this area, correct? Do you see how you have two? You have one on this side and one on the other side. Do you see that? Please say yes or no. It, yes, all right. All right, so you said A, and there, here you have A. So you have two A's because there's two bigger sides and four smaller sides. Is that making sense to you? So that's why a prism is going to be a little different when you're calculating surface area. So surface area for these two here, for these two here, the surface area calculations have to be, uh, in the case of the large, I'm doing this calculation with you, the large is, it has to be two, uh, let's say, let's call it A. A side has two of them, correct? So that means two sides, I'm just going to put sides here, times three inches times three inches. So it's a three by three, correct? So that's a total of what? 18. 18 centimeters squared. That's just for the big side, though. We have to worry about B now. We have side B. And how many side Bs are there? There's four. Who said two? Who said two? If you if you said if you said two, if you said two, it's okay that you said two. I need to know why you think there's only two. Right, and we're not doing A. I said B. So there's an A and a B. There's four Bs. The smaller sides. It's not, it's not three times three. Look at, look at what I wrote. What am I writing? Three times three, that's the area of one side, times how many sides? Two sides. All right, you got it? See, this is how we learn, people. You have to speak up. Don't sit there and quietly be confused in your brain and then go home not understanding what you're doing. This is why taking notes and making sure that you're doing Cornell notes is so important. If you're not writing out the process, you're gonna be confused on the test. So now let's look at B. B is how many sides, how many sides are the smaller ends? Four sides. And what is their area? Three times one. So what's the total area? Surface area of the smaller sides. 12 centimeters squared. Now for the large, that's it. That's all I need for surface area. So now I, all I got to do is add them up. And what's my, what's my total? Thirty centimeters squared. That's the surface area of that. Now what is the volume of that cube? The surface area is easy. I mean, the volume is easy. There's no question what volume is. If you don't know how to, you need to know how to calculate this. This is something everybody should be able to do. How do you calculate the volume of a cube or a prism? It's the same way. Leg, length times width times depth. The three dimensions multiplied with each other. 
All right, so that should be, I hope that that's, that's, that's easy to understand. It's length times width times depth. Because it, this not, we're, not, we're not talking about the surface area, we're talking about the, the space inside the prism, then this is easy. We only have, so what are we talking about here? It's what's the, what are the numbers? Or what are the numbers? Three times three times one. So what's the volume? Nine centimeters cubed. Uh, as an aside, something that you nurses and doctors may want to make sure. Have you ever heard in a hospital show somebody say CC? That is centimeters cubed. That's equal to a milliliter. A milliliter is a cc. One cc is equal to one centimeter cubed, which is one milliliter. That's the volume inside the small cube. So when you're talking as a nurse or a doctor, if you're or physician assistant, nursing assistant, whatever you become in the health field, if you ever hear cc, they're talking about cubic centimeter or milliliter. All right, now that we got over that mistake. So that's those two. This one, this one is so much easier because it is a true cube, which is why last year that worked out a lot better. This one is a true cube. So it's one centimeter. I put inches. Shoot. Uh, I should not have put inches. This is my American side coming out. America is the only place, really the only, mostly the only place that uses inches. I grew up doing construction and working in inches, so. What does that mean? Is Halloween a time for, I, I, I don't know about you, but I, when I grew up, it was, Halloween was a time for dressing up and having fun and and trick-or-treating and candy. Was, is it now, uh, in this generation, is it time to be rude? Is it rude day? It depends. Oh, okay. Just checking. All right. So one centimeter cubed. Uh, so what's, what's really cool about this, when it's all one centimeter, that we can do what's one centimeter times one centimeter, and that equals one centimeter squared. And uh, since this is one side, this is side A, side A, B, C, and D, all six sides are the same, right? So I can multiply times six, and I get six centimeters squared. So that's life is really easy. Uh, total surface area is equal to six centimeters squared. Because it is a true cube, it's easy to do. Then when you're dealing with B, uh, which is the volume, I shouldn't put A and B now because that's just going to confuse you. So then the total surface area of a, of a cube is easy. The volume, of course, is easy. The volume is equal to one centimeter times one centimeter times one centimeter, which equals one centimeter cubed. Now, I keep saying this. To me, it's very, very easy to see it. I see it in my head. I'm wondering if you see it. When you multiply any variable, and this includes the CM. The CM is a unit. It just is a unit, right? But you can look at this as having an exponent. What exponent does that have? Oh, it has a one. When you multiply variables with an exponent, you add the exponents. You should write that down if you don't know it. If you don't know it by heart, if it's not obvious to you, you should write it down because you're going to see it on the SAT, PS, uh, you should have saw it on the PSAT. You'll see it on the SAT, in math, all over, in science, everywhere. You multiply variables, or units, in this case units, but any variable, you you're, multiple, you're adding the exponents. If you divide a variable, 
you're subtracting the exponents. All right? When you, when you add... Multiplying variables requires you to add the exponents. Oh my God, you keep coming for me. I'm going to come for you. You're not going to be happy. All right, to add the exponents. All right, when you divide the variables it requires you to subtract the exponents. I'm going to warn you about this as well. Do not, I see some people having conversations and some of them actually asked me to explain this again. So that's interesting. So x times y does not equal xy squared. All right, that's not how this works. Because they have to be the same. These two variables have to be the same. However, x times x does equal x squared. Okay, x times x times x equals x cubed. That's true as well. And x cubed divided by x squared equals x. You're subtracting the exponents. Okay? Those are some examples. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, just, this is one of those really essential pieces of knowledge that you really should have already in your toolbox. If you don't have that in your toolbox, you really need to have it. So get to developing it. All right. Yes? Say what now? Yeah, if you did x times xy, it equals x squared y because this xy means x times y. They're just not putting the they're just not putting the little asterisks or the dot. And that's does that make sense? Yeah. This just shorthand. Look, when you have when you're doing calculus or you're doing a math problem or a science problem, and you got a million steps and you're writing, writing, writing. You don't want to have to sit there and put little asterisks or X's or, or whatever all day long. So they come up with all kinds of shorthands. That's the way it is. All right. So, yeah. That does it. When you see that, you guys got to get to the point where you see X, Y, you, you're already thinking it's X times Y. All right. All right. So there, there's, that, there's some algebra there for you, some geometry, a some, little bit of everything in this problem. All right, so now let's go ahead and take a look at this. This is Cornell Notes, right? So let's make sure we write down that this is uh, volume versus surface area Be careful. Calculating surface area of a prism right. Be careful calculating the surface area of a prism it is not the same as a cube. All right, people say that it takes them, it ta they, they can't keep up with the writing on the notes. So I want to point out that I said it. 
I paused, I wrote it, I paused again. So everyone should have written it if you were paying attention, you're following along. So that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of the important part there. Another student who did excellent notes and suggested that she would like to do this. And I don't mind if you do this. I don't mind at all. She just wants to put a line here, kind of dividing the different sections of her notes, which is fine. You don't have to do it. You do it any way you want as far as that's concerned. When I'm looking at your notes, I'm looking to see, did you reduce, did you take all this information and reduce it to its essential? When I look at... When I go back to see, when I go back to study, do I know where I, what I'm looking at when I'm looking at this? If I see a bunch of, uh, you know, semi-important points written down with no labels, no connections, no summaries, no main ideas, I'm questioning whether you're going to be able to use it to, to actually prepare for an exam. And I'm taking points off. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. So now, then you had this, uh, you were basing the lab, uh, the, the, the primary technique was the use of an indicator. Phenolphthalein. So this indicator phenolphthalein was being used. Well, how did that work? So let's go through it and make sure you understand. Uh, phenolphthalein was a base. So we added it to, we added, we had a beaker that was filled with sodium hydroxide and water. It's a strong base, so what you had in this water was actually a lot of OH negatives plus NA positives plus water. And what happens in a situation like this where you have OH negatives, I can't really write it very well. So, uh, so this being uh, a cube of gelatinous material, this OH is going to flow with the water. Does that make sense? All right. So that's a base. It's a base because this OH negative acts as a base. And the sodium ion just floats around. Uh, okay. So when you take... This, this OH, let's just get rid of the sodium ion, if you don't mind. We're not going to worry about the sodium ion. We can't indicate it. We don't see it. I'm going to get rid of that, and I'm, gonna get, I'm not going to even worry about the water. When you take this hydroxide, where's the hydroxide coming from? The OH negative, where's it coming from? Sodium hydroxide. It's also known as lye. It's in bleach. L-Y-E, not L-I-E. It's in lye, it's in bleach. We use it to make soaps. If you mix sodium hydroxide with fat, it'll make a soap. It'll help ionize and make a, uh, it'll turn that fat into soap. All right, so lye is a very important naturally occurring substance, but sodium hydroxide, uh, we also use it in bleach uh, to make it very, uh, in the process, in, so when you have a bottle of bleach, you're also dealing with that. Uh, Drano is made of sodium hydroxide. All right, so sodium hydroxide. We're getting the OH as it goes into water. You get OH by itself. Does that make sense? Yes or no, please. Yes. It's okay if it's no. So these hydroxides are floating around in the water. They're small. This is not a membrane. This cube of agrose was not a membrane. Remember, remember, it was just a gel of really tiny holes, right? It's not a membrane. So it allow charge through, charged particles through. It will allow. It's not very impermeable. Yeah. The only thing that separated, this particular filter only worked on size. It did not impact, it was not impacted by charge. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, yeah. So you said that once the OH enters the water, it's like by itself. Where does the NA go? It's there. It's in the water too, but we're not going to dry it. So the sodium is there as well. I'm not concerned about the sodium because it's not part of the chemical reaction. All right, it's in the water. It's salty. The water's salty now. Does that make sense? Not that you want to taste it because you'll get hurt. Correct? Correct? All right. So when you add an, a strong acid, we added something called HCl. Now when HCl goes into water, it's a strong acid, so it breaks up an H plus plus Cl. There's water as well. I'm just telling you. I'm just putting this out here that HCl breaks up into H plus and Cl minus. Yes, water's in there as well. So when, again, the important part here is that hydrogen ion is going to mix with O with OH negative and become H2O. So it becomes water. So the OH negative and the hydrogen ion from the HCl, the hydrochloric acid, they turn into water, which is what pH? What's the pH is water? Seven. seven. So this is a pH of seven. This is going to be important, right? The pH is part of that indicator process, so that becomes a. So this was this particular substance was acid. So a pH of pH of was less than seven. This was a pH of greater than seven. Now we have a pH of seven. We call this a neutralization reaction. We've neutralized the acid and the base. You don't have an acid or a base now. You have something that's neutral. It's called neutralization reaction. So to lay it all out, if you take NaOH aqueous, what does AQ mean? Aqueous, what does aqueous mean? NaOH in water means water. Yeah, in what? NaOH aqueous NaOH. So in sodium hydroxide in water. Add it to HCl aqueous. It was a low molarity. Both were low molarity. I made sure it wasn't too strong, so nobody got hurt. Assuming they follow directions. When you mix those two, what's going to happen is the hydroxide is going to go with the hydrogen and make water. You asked what happened to the sodium. The so, so NaOH it becomes H2O, the OH and the hydrogen. So again, I'm going to draw it out this way. This combined with this to form that. Is that clear? All right. So we're recombining. This is the essence of a chemical reaction. The exchange of bonds between elements, as we've discussed since August. Sodium and chloride, which again was in the water, was in the water. You know, because you were getting your orange juice. I wasn't sure whether you were listening. Sodium and chloride come together. And they're just in the water. They're, they're dissolved in the water. Eventually, if you dried it all out, it would become NaCl, which you know is table salt. So that's most neutralization reactions end up the same way. You're making water. The products, these are the product side, are salt and water. Different kinds of salt. In this case, it's table salt, but you could have different, if you, if instead of, uh, hydrochloric acid, you had some other, uh, instead of sodium hydroxide, you had lithium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide, you'd have a different salt in the end. Yeah? So if you take an acid and a base, will it always end up neutral? Yes. If it's not like the exact opposite? Uh, acid and base neutralize each other. Okay. 
They will, they will make, usually, depending on what the elements are, that, but most of the time they're going to make water and salt. All right. So that was the essence. That was the background I think you need to know. Again, this was what was this? This was a neutralization reaction. And then this up here, phenolphthalein, uh, uh, was pink when the pH was greater than 7. So we had the phenolphthalein in, and I'm going to go ahead and draw the line again. Now we we went we had the we had the little uh, the little cube. Uh, it, we had soaked it when we made the cube. We used sodium hydroxide, so we we our our cube was pink. Okay. Then we took that, that pink cube. We took that, that pink cube and we put it into the acid. It was hydrochloric acid. As the hydrochloric acid in, in water, as the, as the hydrogen ions in water, as, as osmosis, right? As we had osmosis moving into the pink cube, what you saw, and I think everybody saw it. I didn't see this not happen to anyone. This is the successful part of this lab, the part that wasn't my mistake. You guys did a great job. But what you saw was, I can't, okay, let's try that. It started to, it started to get clear, didn't it? Really pale, like almost like a jellyfish, because that's what it was. It was a gel. It's a gel. It lost all its color because phenolphthalein only has color. It's a molecule. It's a pro it's a molecule that only uh, only absorbs light when it is in a solution that's mostly OH, mostly base. So a basic solution. And why is that? Why? And that's another story. But does that make sense so far? So that that I think is all you really need to know. What we to really understand what we did for the lab to help you la do the lab write up and get the numbers straight. I'll be here Thursday after school if you need to if you need help with that. And Thursday morning and Friday morning if you need help with any of this part of the lab report. The introduction, the data, the results. I have little videos in the assignment that are walking you through how to do that right up. If you have problems, you can see me, okay? Or if you just want me to take a look at it, see if you're on the right track, you can see me Thursday morning, Friday morning, or Thursday after school. But I expect the lab write up done by Monday. I expect it to be including. Uh, the discussion of what is osmosis, what, uh, what is, how, what, how does this indicator work, how do you know that osmosis was occurring, uh, what did you expect to happen, uh, how, uh, did you expect this larger surface area to, to increase or decrease the time it took for the cube to lose all its color. Right, so that's the kind of thing that I was looking that I'm looking to see is do you understand this idea of osmosis? That's what I'm looking for. One of the so what is this? This is the Yeah. Help you feel better, kid.
Now, honestly, this I would have written on this side. I really should have written it over here. I wonder if I can move it. No. Can I? No. No. It's interesting. All right, so that's the detail, and, and probably osmosis is what I would want to write on this side. I'm trying to keep this side neat and down to the very bare minimum, trying to reduce, reduce, reduce. So osmosis is what I would write here. Now, one of the homework questions I gave you that some people, most, a lot of people didn't do, which is sad, and would have helped you a lot on this lab if you would have paid attention, was, which is how do, the question was how does, how do living systems increase surface area? And the answer, is by folding. Folding allows for greater surface area. If you only have a stomach and you have to have a lot of surface area because you need to absorb a lot of food, but you only have this much space, if you think about a, a small person like a child, uh, not someone, a big guy like me, but on, honestly, someone like myself and someone like you, we have the same abdomen size, the same space for our abdomen. What you see here around my belly is fat. That's on the outside. The abdomen itself, the intestine is no bigger. Does that make any sense? Not much bigger. Larger People can have, like if you're taller and wider, you could have more space, but generally when you see a fat belly like mine, it is just fat. It's not that the intestine's any larger. So the question is how, do you inc how does life increase surface area without, because you remember, why does it have to fold the tissues? Because what is it, ha what, if you did the lab, you should know that you should know that the, the cell cells tend to stay small. They have to be small. Why do they want, why do they why do they tend to be small in living things? Because small things have what? That's right. Because small cells have greater surface area to volume ratios. The larger cell has a bigger, has a bigger surface area, but when you compare it to the volume, the surface area divided by the volume, that number all of a sudden gets smaller. And when you do your calculations, you should see that. If you don't see that, there's, an, there's some kind of error we gotta, we gotta resolve. So because of that, we have to keep the cells small, but then increase the surface area somehow. So what we do is we fold things. We fold them back and forth, back and forth. In fact, it's not just folded this way. Here, if we took, if we took, a, look, if we took a look at the intestine, if we, look at, if we looked at the intestine, just did a big zoom in, of the intestine, what we would find is that part of the intestine also goes up and down. So you have my, these things called microvilli, or in, in the intestine, they're diverticulum. If you opened up a, an intestine and looked at it, and we, we could, I could, I could get a pig from the butcher shop, and we could open it up, or, or uh, cows would be too big and maybe I can get a, a big piece of intestine from the, from the slaughterhouse, but 
I can get a piece of intestine from this. What's Halloween? If you're eating meat, you know it's, it's from a beast. The beast died, why waste the meat, right? So a diverticulum, you could see the diverticulum, we could actually look at it. Uh, so that there's folds within folds within folds. And if you looked even closer, what you would see is the actual cells, are, they make up, that's where these, that, this is where the cells are, right here. So now the cells can stay small and you can have a lot of surface area. Do you see all this surface area? So you get hundreds of feet of, uh, many, many tens of feet of, of, uh, of twi by folding you get tens of feet of length. By folding even more, you get even more length. And then each little cell can stay, the volume of the cell can stay small. You can get quick osmosis, quick diffusion, and they can just transfer over and over again. Of course, that requires you to have something called a circulatory system. So now you have to have small veins and arteries uh, coming in and kind of laying out. We call these things capillaries. They, they surround the tissues, tiny, tiny little blood vessels called capillaries, and they connect to these tiny, these bigger and bigger things called veins and arteries. And they go all throughout the body, and they go, obviously go to the heart and the liver, and et cetera. So we call that a capillary bed. All right, so that should help you with your lab write-up. Uh, and tomorrow we'll do osmosis problems. Did that help? Did that solve all our problems? All right. All right, so when we look, first let's talk about what is it, what is it to be emulsified. You eat fat, either the fat on a steak or the fat in oil that from olive oil or from corn oil, you're eating fat. When it, fat in water normally acts like this, where you have a layer of fat floating in water. That does not help you. You need, in order, are you, can I have your phone please? Give me your phone. Just hand me your phone. Why are you, why are you staring at me? Thank you. Yep. All right, so when we're dealing with when we're dealing with fat, you have to somehow get the fat from th this separation of non nonpolar and polar, right? This this kind of layered situation. We have to create an emulsification. When you make salad dressing, you're creating an emulsification using an acid an acid known as vinegar, and you're mixing it with an oil, the vinegar helps, uh, is an acid that allows the oils to be emulsified. In other words, you create micelles, these little balls of fat, that allow for this to occur. You can now pour it over your salad, and you're not, you're not, you're not just pouring olive oil on top of your salad dressing, or salad. It looks like this, it actually looks like this. You pour oil into water and you get these globules. If you have a good emulsifier, it turns into something like this. If not, they start to separate and lay and separate in the in the in the jar. If you've ever seen peanut butter that you put in a refrigerator, don't ever put peanut butter in the refrigerator, because what you'll see is that the emulsification process will separate, the oil and the water will separate. You'll have a thick layer of oil at the top, and the rest of it will be uh, water underneath not very tasty to keep it mixed you need an emulsifier your your digestive system has this great little thing here called the uh, gallbladder the gallbladder produces an emulsifier it helps you uh, put the fats into solution yes question Dude, that'd be like, like you know how when you use something you gotta shake it that's right. That's it. Yeah, that's exactly why you have to shake it. Because naturally they'll separate. Oil and water are going to separate. We add emulsifiers, salts, and, and acids.
to help keep them in those tiny little balls, those tiny little balls of fat. So when we pour it over our salad, we can eat it. It's well distributed. Otherwise, we're eating this glob of oil on top of our salad, just not really pleasant. How do you spell emulsify? E M. Uh, it says it here somewhere. We'll get it if you don't mind. E M. Emulsify. Yeah, E M U L S I F I E R. It's called emulsification. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're gonna look at it just right now, actually. So when you eat something, this is coming. This is the esophagus coming in from your mouth. It goes into your stomach. In your stomach, you have acids. Uh, Notice the lining of the stomach, it has protection against the acid so that the acid doesn't end up eating your uh, stomach lining. When that protection's gone, you get an ulcer. That's, why, that's how you get an ulcer. The fat, the acid in your stomach actually burns a hole in your, in your stomach. Uh, so the little short chain fatty acids, little tiny fatty acids, they get absorbed right away. That's not a problem. The cells t take them in. But the longer chain fatty acids, the, the healthier ones, like the olive oils, the long chains of carbon, they have a real problem. They cannot, they cannot uh, be absorbed in the stomach. So what happens is they go on in, through the duogenum, this is the opening into the small intestine, and they get the gallbladder, which sits right underneath the stomach, lets loose bile salts. Bile salts act as an emulsifier. Mr. Bedosa's room, may I help you? Uh, I, I guess, yeah, I don't want to stop her, but it's kind of, yeah, all right, yep. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to, that's fine. Sydney, go on into the uh, office to Mr. Uh, Dalvin. You'll be gone for 15 minutes. I don't know how, how much time we have left in class, so. And that's okay. It's important that you, that I, I, I personally think it's important that you meet with your college reps for about stuff like this. Okay. I will uh, post this online. All right. So gallbladder, the gallbladder releases these bile salts, bile acids, they produce salts, and these acids help emulsify the, the fats. Without them, it's harder for you to digest fat. So if they remove your gallbladder, because you have gallstones, they'll remove your gallbladder. Several of your teachers have had their uh, gallbladders removed. If they remove the gallbladder, then you're gonna have to eat a lot less fat. If you eat fat without the gallbladder, it's, you're going to get sick. You'll literally vomit and other problems. So notice what happens to the fats. Because of these, uh, these uh, bile acids, they, they make micelles. And the micelles now can travel in the intestines and be uh, quickly absorbed uh, as they move through the system. This is a kind of a close-up. Now, let's first look at this. This is your large intestine. Uh, so you have a small intestine, it goes round and round and back and forth, back and forth. Uh, we'll look at the large intestine later in a, in a different view in a minute. But when you look at the folds, look how much folding there is in the intestine. Not only does the intestine itself fold over twice, the large intestine folds over twice, the small one does many turns back and forth it also has folds inside it, and inside those folds are other folds, you see here. And then these folds each are made of cells, but then the cells themselves have tiny little microvilli. So the membrane of the cell also folds. So folds within folds within folds. It increases the surface area and allows for maximum absorption. Without that, it would, you would not be able to eat and digest the foods that you eat. So those are several layers of folding that I hope you can see. 
And notice that on the other end, you have, and there, of course, there's your, by the way, there's your, in this case, it's absorbing water. The large intestine is trying to absorb as much water as it can because you put a lot of water into the small intestine to help you digest those foods, to help you not just give it a solution, but also to do hydrolysis. Now, here you have fatty acids and monoglass, uh, monoglycerides here. If you emulsify them with, with the acids, you make micelles. Now the micelles can be absorbed into the, into the lining of the intestine. From the, you should make sure you write this down, that it goes from the lumen, from a space, into the membrane. When something gets absorbed in the membrane, first goes to the Golgi body, that then packages it into membranes with, with molecules on the surface of the membrane, telling it, take it to where it needs to go. So it, it packages it, and then it sends it to the other side of the cell into the capillaries. The capillaries are the small blood vessels that surround all your tissues. Some of it will go into the lymph system. So the lymph system is, uh, uh, is part of your immune system. It carries white blood cells. It carries other fluids, but the blood is where the nutrients go. And that goes, if it goes into the capillary, that goes into the liver. So it goes from the intestine into the cells, goes to the Golgi body, from the Golgi body, goes back out of the cell on the opposite side, goes into the capillary, which is your bloodstream. From the capillary, goes into the, into the vein, because it's moving to, uh, away from the heart, I mean, towards the heart. Remember, any blood vessel going towards the heart is a vein. So it collects, so these capillaries are moving towards the vein. From that vein, it goes to the, to the liver. From the liver, the liver does whatever digestion it needs to do. It takes out any poisons. When you drink alcohol, it goes this way through the intestines into your bloodstream. Your liver then detoxifies the alcohol as much as it can to try to make sure that you don't die from the poison. Alcohol is a poison. And you take it and from there it goes to your heart and from your heart to the rest of your body. Question? You had a question? Knots? Are you talking about a hernia? We you talking about knots, what do you mean? The feeling of the nervousness feeling or do you mean an actual twist of the intestine? That what happens is that you have something called connective tissue that holds your intestines still. So you're not, they're not just flopping around. Does that make sense? You have a layer of tissue that's called connective tissue that holds all your intestines in. If you pull a muscle, if you push, push or strain yourself too much, you could rip that tissue and it makes a hole. And then through regular movement of your life, the intestine could start to put, poke through the hole and if part of it's poking through, as you're moving around, lifting, bending, whatever, it twists. If it twists through the hole, you get, you get what's called a hernia. They have to operate in order to get it back in there, sew that hole up, because otherwise that blood circulation stops. Like when you stop, you know, what happens if you stop blood circulating to that intestine? Huh? It dies, the tissue dies, it breaks apart. What's inside the intestine? Well, yeah. But it's bacteria. There's bacteria in here helping us digest. If this tissue dies, that bacteria will eat that tissue. It will get into your bloodstream and you'll have sepsis. All right? The same thing that would happen if your appendix burst. The bacteria would fill your blood and you'd have sepsis. So that's, those are really dangerous situations that they have to get that taken care of. So that's how your intestines would twist. So that's, that kind of bending is, or folding is bad. So here again, there, there's another example of how you get oil droplets then, uh, and bile salts or bile uh, acids to where they need to go so that you can digest lipids, break them down. This is a picture of the, the, your large intestine. Your intestine has diverticuli, and when you get... Uh, 
if you have uh, an intestine that has a lot of these, if you have diverticulitis, it actually, uh, it actually starts to make these pockets and they get infected. And they have to actually remove a big chunk of your intestine. You'll have an ostomy bag uh, in order to capture the poop while, you're, uh, while your surgery heals, if it's able to heal. So diverticula, in fact, you, by the time you're 45 or 50, I don't know if they'll change this by the time you're my age, but they'll have, you'll have to have a, a camera go up your butt and one down your throat. We call one, the one up your butt is called, uh, oh, what's it called? Oh my gosh. It's an endoscopy and there's a uh, colonoscopy. So endoscopy is when you go down your throat, uh, colonoscopy is when you go up into your colon. Let me tell you right now, you'd ra- the colon is much more pleasure, much more pleasurable than the endoscopy. The endoscopy, let me tell you something. They're both bad. They both feel bad. But the col- the endoscopy, you literally feel like you're choking. You're like you're, they're sticking it down your throat, into your stomach, then into your intestine, and they're taking pictures, and you're just. You're laying down. Actually, I was watching on the screen. I asked them to use minimal anesthesia because I'm going to warn you right now when you're doing surgeries, the most dangerous part of any surgery is anesthesia. So you got to make sure that whatever you end up getting done in your life, that you, you, you have them do the minimal amount of anesthesia. Because it's not about falling asleep. If it was just falling asleep, that's fine. It's about waking up. Like some people, it... That it can cause serious issues. So I told them using the minimal anesthesia, let me tell you something, that endoscopy, wow. I thought I was gonna die. I was, I was doing the whole Navy SEAL uh, 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 meditation thing, just to, not to panic. Uh, so when you do it, and you will do it eventually in your life, you, ha- you have to. Or you take the risk, uh, well, you'll do it because you won't have a choice, so. So diverticulitis, that's pretty much it for folding and for this material. Now on your next, on your lab, I want to make sure, or not your lab, on your, so that's it. First of all, let me end, end there. Does that make sense? So you know, you're going to be able to write up your lab report without too much trouble. You have the explanations of what each of the sections are. Is it time to leave already? Yeah. Your, uh, your, your AP classroom is on, is on enzymes. It's the, next, it's the next unit. This week we're, work, we're finishing osmosis and diffusion. Your next unit starts uh, on AP, with AP classroom. All right, have a good one.